Okay. Okay. So thank you, thank you for um, inviting us here. Hey, so I see some really old friends there. Yeah, really good. I was about to start, but I, I'll restart again for you. <laughs> um, and um, so yeah, uh, what what I will try to do. So I assume, as you may know, I haven't been working that much on, to be frank, on pragmatics lately. But I still hope that I have something kind of more or less interesting to say. And um, uh, I'll present some older studies from my lab and uh, one new study we kind of, uh, we've been doing with, with a friend of mine uh, lately. Uh, and that one is the first time I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about it. Uh, so be kind. You know? uh, so I'll, what I'll do is I will outline three uh, really crude formulations of uh, how a post Bryson pragmatic model can be um, uh, implemented in a, in, in a cognitive model of, of uh, in psychological model of utterance interpretation. And I guess the most stronger, the strongest one, the, the most basic one, is to say that basically any kind of utterance interpretation, any kind of pragmatic processing, is uh, somehow rooted in the attribution of some kind of mental states to the speaker. Uh, you'll see I'll try to avoid the term theory of mind throughout the talk because I think it's something, it's not a really clear notion, notion to begin with and I have nothing to say really today about this. So basically the idea is you get sentence meaning and if you want to go from sentence meaning to any kind of speaker meaning you need a complex mind reading beat Referen referential resolution, loose speech, hyperbole, metaphor, indirect speech acts, particularized implicature, irony, whatever. Now, well, the most obviously the, the kind of paradigmatic proponents of, of this view uh, is at least some trends in, uh, uh, in, in relevant theory, but there are others, uh, uh, many others actually. Um, so it's not a straw man, right, really. Uh, for instance, recently, uh, Diana Mazzarelli and, and Aaron Novick, we, we got some kind of pretty civilized debate, and they defend this model. And uh, very recently, a recent addition to, to this literature is uh, uh, Yolanda's um, dissertation, which we had the opportunity to talk about yesterday. One really clear reason, I think, this empirical reason this kind of view is difficult to defend, at least again in its kind of psychological implementation, is evidence from autism. Um, now, just briefly, I guess everyone knows a bit about autism. It's a neurodevelopmental disorder. The prevalence varies widely depending on the kind of uh, numbers you get, but more or less it's between one child over 100 or over one child over. 70, that gets one form or another of autism. And the clinical definition is a combination of atypical, um, stereotypical behaviorals, or atypical uh, interests, and marked difficulties in verbal and nonverbal social interaction. And of course, there is great heterogeneity. It's an important and really kind of uh, complicated debate we, we talked about that yesterday, and today uh, I'll focus on the on a really highly verbal end of the autism spectrum. Uh, even though I think we need to 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 look into minimally verbal kids, and this is something that uh, we do a lot in my lab uh, lately, well, in the last five years. Um, if you look at the diagnostic criteria listed in the last edition of DSM, the DSM five. Under the point four, what you see is difficulties in understanding what is not explicitly stated, making inferences, they, they have implicatures in mind, really. 
and non literal or ambiguous meanings of language, idioms, humor, etc., etc. Now, this is a really kind of, this is crude uh, and kind of gross oversimplification, but what, um, what I believe and others than, than in other labs and other groups have argued for is that actually the um, pragmatic difficulties in, in, in autism um, are selective. There are some areas that uh, are more challenging than others. Uh, and this is the evidence I'll be briefly surveying now. Uh, because why it's relevant? Because I think that the only way to convincingly, convincingly explain this kind of selective pattern is by acknowledging that there may be different kinds of uh, pragmatic processes and some being more challenging than others um, for individuals on the autism spectrum. Uh, metaphor is a really good place to start with this discussion. It's probably one of the most discussed, actually, examples. So there is growing, well, ma ma there, are, there are many, many papers, actually, which show that m metaphor comprehension uh, is not uh, uh, intrinsically impaired in autism, and actually, I've, I didn't work on metaphor, somebody else did, who is just here. So I'm just, you know. But since I know that Nausicaa won't be talking about metaphor, I, I kind of, you won't be, right? Okay, so go on. So basically, um, metaphor comprehension is predicted in autism and actually elsewhere by uh, simply lexical knowledge. I mean, the extent of vocabulary, more or less. What's really interesting is not only autistic um, individuals don't seem to have, well, sometimes they have difficulties grasping metaphors by others because they don't know in which direction to go. And this is, there is a really nice, um, I think, uh, paper by Catherine Waring exploring this, this idea. I, I like it very much. But also, whenever you interact with like highly verbal, well, not whenever, but very often when you interact with highly verbal autistic individuals, you realize that they do produce a lot of vivid and frequently meta idiosyncratic metaphors. And sometimes these metaphors are a bit challenging for us to grasp because we don't know in which direction, you know, you have to modulate the, the meaning. Um, so the idea here is that metaphor, you notice metaphor comprehension and production may not always be guided by assumption about interlocutors, right? By what you may grasp or what you were intending your audience to grasp, right? So you have pragmatics, but not necessarily tuned to the perspective of uh, your conversational partner. Um, Pretty much the same conclusion arises when you look at the literature on uh, scalar implicatures. I'll come back to the scalar implicatures in the end, toward the end of, of my talk, because I actually think that there is something weird in, in this literature. But anyway, uh, so basically everyone knows what a scalar implicature is. I don't have to go through this. Or do I? Do I? I don't. Right. So the idea being that uh, you know, uh, if you, if I say uh, if if I say you know, uh, some people like my talk, I kind of implicate that not all of them like my talk. Um, what the literature consistently shows is that autistic individuals derive seem to to derive this kind of implicature to the same extent uh, as neurotypicals. Um, However, when you, um, you, you, you change slightly the experimental settings um, so that you really need to reason about what the other person, what the speaker knows, or whether you have to really reason about what the speaker may have believed, and uh, I won't get into the details, but during discussion, if you're interested, I can give you the details. Then, in these cases, um, autistic individuals uh, don't uh, process implicatures in the same way. Uh, and this has been shown in this really nice paper by Hausstein and colleagues. 
and also in a paper we did with my former postdoc, Bob Van Til. Um, another uh, kind of interesting uh, finding, uh, this, this was a paper by Ekaterina Ostashenko, a former PhD student of mine. Um, what we did, we looked at um, epistemic trust in kids, autistic kids, and, and, and typically developing kids, and also kids with DLD, but I won't be uh, mentioning that here. So basically, we had two conditions. In the first condition, what you had, you had two adults, and one adult would be always mistaken about the meaning of really kind of uh, common words, right? And reliable speaker. And then kids had to choose whether they would knew, whether from which speaker they would learn new labels for new words, right? So you had a new object, and one speaker said, this is, I don't know, a modi, and the other speaker said, no, no, it's a tupi. And, and we looked at which was the speaker kids would trust to learn this new word. And in this first condition, autistic kids and typically developing kids systematically disregarded the speaker who was wrong about the meaning of, say, fork or dog, right? So they disregarded the unreliable speaker. That could, you know, point towards some kind of advanced pragmatic processing, right? What was really interesting is that in the second condition, and, and the eye tracking data was really consistent with the reaction, uh, with the behavioral data. What was really interesting is that in the second condition, at first, you, you had two new speakers, and both were correct about the meaning of familiar words, except that one needed help from a puppet, right? So speakers were asked, okay, show me, uh, I don't know, the, 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 do the dog, and one, one speaker said, oh, this is the dog, and the other speaker said, I don't know, then a puppet would come and say, oh, do you need help? And said, ah, oh, yeah, and, and then, and then the, 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 the puppet would help that speaker. And then again, we looked at which of these speakers kids would trust for the meanings of new words. And here what we found is that typical developing kids, um, of the age, they were six year old, sorry, I should have said that earlier, they would disregard this you know, uncertain speaker. Autistic kids, they, they just, they, they were at random at, between these two. So basically, what this kind of shows that there is kind of in autism some surface mechanism to disregard and reliable sources of, 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 of information. But again, once you had to reason about, you know, what, what's the epistemic state of, you know, of, 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 of these sources of information, uh, you had um, um, differences. Autistic kids didn't, didn't look like they were doing this. Now, um, oh yeah, irony, you know, we, we, you know, it would have been weird um, whether not to mention irony. Here, um, I just need to activate the sound for that one. Okay, so irony, um, as I mentioned yesterday, actually in my questions uh, um, in uh, uh, Yolanda's Viva, Many people found, well, several studies found that when you present autistic individuals with a forced choice uh, between, you, you know, ironic or not ironic meanings, they, they perform well. So if you say, okay, you know, uh, John doesn't like the weather, and then he says, oh, such a lovely weather, is he being ironic or not, then autistic people perform uh, uh, above chance. What we did in this study, uh, we conducted an act-out um, uh, study. So what we wanted to see is not how uh, participants discriminate between different paraphrases or different interpretation of a sentence, but do they actually really grasp the actual meaning? And this is a paradigm inspired by a um, uh, paradigm used by Pexman and colleagues. Um, so basically what we had, we had like videos like these. So it's, it's, it's in French. And we had professional actors to do that. Why we needed professional actors? Because what the guy says is, I, you know, I like tea, right? And you have tea and um, milk. And the participant had to choose which one of these the participants actually wants, right? And why we needed professional actors is because we had, we varied uh, different uh, conditions. So 
the speaker was either ironic or he was literally saying, yeah, I really like this, or he was literally saying, yeah, I don't like this. But either you had, in each of the conditions, either you had information about background information about what, he is li what the speaker likes, and the intonation for each condition was either marked or neutral. So it could be literal, yes marked, literal no marked, or, or ironic non marked, or neutral. And the same thing with facial expression. The reason why we needed professional actors is because it's really hard to keep um, a neutral uh, fac facial expression if you have uh, a marked intonation and vice versa. So they, they actually they struggle a lot. But, but we did it. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this a bit later for a reason you'll understand. We checked uh, the, the reliability of these. So, and then we, 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 we use this um, with autistic adults and in, in matched neurotypical adults. And what we find is that with ironic items in this, uh, in this uh, paradigm where you don't ask people to judge whether, something, whether he meant this or not, you actually, they have to decide what does he want based on his utterance. In the ironic condition, um, uh, autistic adults perform below chance. Okay. What's interesting is that they have neither prosody or the intonation or facial expression helped them. What did help them is when you had incongruence with the context. Because, as I mentioned yesterday, often um, these uh, autistic adults get some training and they know that sometimes people being sarcastic, but sarcasm is what you say something that's not, uh, you don't believe it, that's completely false. Incongruence with the context provides you this cue. But they weren't able to, to go beyond that. What's really interesting, the reason why I mentioned this here in this context, so actually we had two tasks um, in, this, in this paper. The second task was the interpretation of indirect speech acts. So there, the idea was to see whether they can interpret indirect requests, or to which extent at least they can associate elocutionary forces with sentence types not conventionally attached to these forces. And that's a design my former PhD student, Nicolas Hortenbeek, used in his PhD. So um, it was again an act-out task. So you had this, this, this touch screen, you had geometrical shapes, um, and two buttons, yes and no, right? And then the participants heard uh, different kinds of instructions uh, throughout headphones, and they had to comply with these instructions. The first kind of instruction is a uh, straightforward question, something like, is the red triangle on the right of the green screen? And you had to answer yes or no. I mean, right. Other kind of instructions were, uh, were uh, uh, an ambiguous request. So move the red ri triangle right to the green square. So, and, and, and so you could do this. So that, that, uh. But then, the interesting items were an indirect request. Something like, can you move the red triangle to the right of the green square? Or if, if you, if, to avoid like conventional form, this was in French, but I'm giving you the equivalence in English. Something like, is it possible to move the red triangle to the right of the green square? There the prediction was that if autistic individuals, as is sometimes claimed in the literature, cannot go beyond the literal meaning, they should always interpret this as questions. So answer, you know, click on the, on the, on the response button rather than moving uh, the shapes. This is not at all what we found, and that's actually consistent with other, other uh, experiments we conducted with autistic kids. I won't be talking about this, but if you're interested, I can send that to you. Uh, we also found that autistic kids interpret indirect speech acts with no problems. And so what you see is that this is the autistic group, this is the neurotypical group. In purple is the response where you move the shape in, 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 in orange when you click. And you can see that they, they, they actually really often uh, move the shape. So they, 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 they can interpret these, these uh, uh, questions as requests. So the interim co conclusion is that there are selective difficulties in task, in pragmatic tasks that generally require you a perspective shift. 
This also shows that some pragmatic tasks are perfectly manageable without engaging in perspective shifting. Now again, I don't, I'm not saying anything about theory of mind. I'm not saying that that shows that they don't have a theory of mind or they have. I, I don't think that it's, I, I think it's a murky concept. But you need a model that can explain that. And uh, so I think that this kind of mind reading across the board con uh, conception of, 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 of pragmatic doesn't work. Um, another view is to say, OK, uh, so we, we should be aiming for um, a typology of pragmatic processes. And you know, for some kind of, some kinds of um, uh, pragmatic output, so to speak, you need so, some kind of pragmatic processes. For some others, you need something else. Uh, you know, for, for instance, you could argue that there are many ways to build this division. Um, for you, you could argue that, you know, for some, some, pragmatic, some pragmatic outputs, you don't need perspective taking, I don't know, reference resolution, loose speech, generalized um, implicature, indirect speech acts, you don't really need perspective taking, but from some others you do need, like our irony, etc. So you build a typology of pragmatic processes based on a typology of pragmatic outputs. So basically you take your textbook in pragmatics and you, you, know, you have different chapters, usually metaphor, irony, implicatures, etc. and you associate different processes with these chapters, so to speak. Um, there are many people defending that a position. Uh, for instance, uh, Napoleon Katzos defended that uh, really famously, Francois Riccanetti. And actually, I did defend that um, when I was younger and foolish. Um, uh, actually, I, so I, you, you, you may have guessed, I think it's wrong. But, but you know. So let's go back to this experiment on irony, this paradigm I showed you earlier, we did with autistic participant. Actually, we did. We, we first tested this, this 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 paradigm in different versions with neurotypical participants. And first, what we did, you know, I talked to you about these recordings of actors with facial expressions and, and uh, different kinds of intonation. First, what we did is we, we took out all the utterances and we asked people on the internet to rate each utterance on an ironic scale going from one to seven. And what you can see is that people, we, we took, uh, people are really good, they marked iron, this really single out the ironic intonation as being ironic, okay? And we did the same thing with facial expressions. So we took out the audio and we, we, we just asked them about, is it ironic or not? And you can really see they're really good at, you know, uh, uh, at, um, saying, okay, the ironic one is ironic, okay? And then they, 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 they had to do the same, act, well, different set of participants, the same um, task, the one I showed you before, so that one, right? They had to decide which, what, what the speaker wants. So what's really interesting is, uh, so don't be scared, uh, but this is the outputs of, uh, of, of regression models. This is accuracy. So what, what, so the intercept are the, uh, is the ironic uh, sentences. What you can see is that people are better at uh, ironic no. Okay, so they, when the speaker ambiguously doesn't want something that's really good. What's interesting is the interaction. Once you add in, in items where you had the context, people are better, right? But what's really interesting is that prosody didn't change anything. It wasn't a significant uh, predictor in the model, so we dropped it. Actually, in the condition when you had the facial, facial expression, people were worse in accuracy. What's even more interesting, these are reaction times. What you can see is that ironic items take longer than literal ones. This is kind of expected. But when you have prosody, and facial expression, reaction times are significantly shorter. So what, what this means is that you have a trade-off. When you have a marked facial expression or a marked prosody, people respond faster, 
but they have a greater chance to respond wrong. What does it mean is that when you ask people to make a forced choice between, between, between facial expression, uh, say asking, is it ironic or not? People are really good. If you ask them to, to say, uh, is, is, uh, is, um, is this intonation ironic or not? People are really good. But when they have to use it in an actual pragmatic interpretation, they're not so good and this is expected. Pragmatic, uh, ironic uh, facial expression and prosody are, are not reliable. We know that from the literature. But the point is here is that people would use these cues at the expense of context and costlier processing because that's faster. And this is actually uh, consistent with another paper where we looked at the same thing. Basically, you had to judge. Uh, it was a complex task. You had to judge whether the speaker was ironic or not, and you had... Uh, a lot of elements in the context and which gave you information about what different interlocutors, what different conversational partners knew about each other's mental states. And what we found again is that when you add, um, when you add intonation, people react really fast, they're really wrong, they disregard all, uh, all information about conversational partners' perspective, they just jump on this really fast cue. Okay, so the, why I'm talking about this here, that shows that even for a given pragmatic output, you have different routes and that people favor that. Um, yeah, this is what just I said. Uh, yeah, uh, perhaps I'll skip this one so we'll have time for discussion. Uh, it's basically the same conclusion with a kind of complicated design on strategic deception. Uh, in autism, we did that also with uh, Bob and Teal. Um, yeah. I'll just look at how long I, yeah, I still have. So here what we see basically is that the same kind of pragmatic task can be solved recurring to uh, different you know, strategies. And, um, and it's true, as I said earlier, that it looks like autistic individuals um, may use alternative strate strategies, alternative to perspective shifting. But what I also believe, and we have also tasked with kids showing this, uh, neurotypical individuals don't use perspective shifting that much either. And when they can favor uh, a really fast response route, they do. Now, you know, perhaps this is just an experimental design, but still. So, yeah, I don't think actually that we should, contrary to what, you know, I've argued before, that we should map some kind of typology of pragmatic processing on a typology of pragmatic outputs. Um, I think this is an oversimplification I think depending on individual um, characteristics and on contextual needs and factors, uh, different pragmatic processes may lead to the same kind of interpretation output. And this is something that Napoleon is arguing now and, uh, and uh, we kind of have a paper we haven't been, we have been not writing for many years about this year, but so, um, I think, so the, I think there is something into this, like saying, okay, basically different pragmatic processes lead from sentence meaning into speaker meanings, and this may be different, right? But I think we should be, and this is kind of the new part of the talk, we should be careful about what we actually mean by speaker meaning, right? Um, and just to explain you what I mean by this, I talk about something really, really tepid, right? You know, the most famous case of, of, uh, in, in experimental pragmatics. You know, underinformative some sentences, right? Some mammals, uh, some elephants are mammals, and the almost universal assumption is, uh, yeah, I should have put false here. I will do that because otherwise it would be really weird in the recording. Um, so if you say false, that's because you 
derived the scalar implicature, some but not all elephants are mammals. Okay? Everyone agrees with this. Yeah? Well. And actually, in the huge literature on processing of scalar implicatures, processing differences between pragmatic and logical responses or between responses to some elephants are mammals or uh, only some elephants are mammals or different variation of thereof, these processing differences are interpreted uh, as reflecting the derivation of scalar implicatures. <laughs> this is particularly true in uh, grammatical uh, accounts of, 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 of uh, scalar implicatures. So the idea is you, you, that this kind of somehow Pragmatic uh, processing differences are somehow related to the cost of deriving this linguistic representation. And uh, for instance, if you read this really nice chapter by Richard Brahini in, in the Oxford uh, Handbook of Experimental Pragmatics and Semantics, there is a really kind of nice summary of all the debate, and, and it's really explicitly framed in, this, um, in, this, um, in these terms. One thing of the, 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 there, is, there is a paper by Napoleon Katzis and Dorothy Bishop where they say, yeah, we, we actually don't know that people really derive this implicature when they say false. But no one really tested it and, and really the debate went on and then it has been transposed to embedded implicatures, etc., etc. So really, I, I'm a really simple-minded person, so I really wanted to see, okay, do people really derive these implicatures? So this was kind of a short experiment we, we built with my really dear friend, Philippe, that some of you know here. Uh, we did three studies on prolific, each with, well, we, we did five, but with, we restricted this to three. Um, uh, all studies had 100 participants, right? So people, I'll show you the three studies because they are really similar and, and, and then I'll give you the results. The design was really kind of really, really, really simple. So people saw on the first screen uh, pictures like this, uh, green balls meant uh, the, 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 the balls, uh, uh, the player scored with red ones, balls he didn't uh, uh, score with. And you had to select true or false, right? And for instance here, if you say false, that standardly means that you derived the uh, implicature, some but not all, right? The next screen, so this screen disappeared. The next screen, we just ask, okay, which sentence corresponds more closely to the sentence you saw on the previous screen? The player scored with some, maybe all the balls, or the player scored with some but not all the balls. And we just wanted to see whether if you respond false, you would select this. You know, if you derived the implicature, you should select, select this. But then we thought, ah, yeah, and, and what they were, just, just so you know, what were kind of the filler, if, if you had no, something like the player scored with no balls, uh, the question was about uh, whether it was a golf player or a hockey player. We tested the memory of the sport, really, in the next screen. But then we thought, okay, but if you do this, you know, these this people maybe get confused, they don't remember what they answered, etc. So we, th we did things. Even, even plainer. First screen, again, the player scored with some balls, right? If you say true or false. But then, the display remained on the screen, and depending on your response, you saw, you decided that sentence above is false because it means that. So we were really explicit there, you know? The player scored with some, maybe all the balls, or the player scored with some, but not all the balls. So, Normally, if you respond false, you should select this, right? I mean, otherwise, it's, it's weird. And then, finally, we did the same thing, but with felicity judgments. So, again, the player was, uh, yeah, and here, the filler items were, again, the memory of the balls, because we had different kind of sports, you know, to make the task a bit kind of challenging. And the, the third experiment, we did exactly the same thing. The player scored with some balls, but you had to decide whether the sentence is the right thing to say in this situation, to avoid, like, truth value judgments. And again, after that, you saw the display, and your response, you decided that the sentence above is not the right thing to say, okay? Okay. The results were rem remarkably consistent uh, 
among them, but also in the, with the literature. So these, uh, these are uh, uh, the means of uh, log logical responses. And this is what you find in the literature. So about 30, around 30% 30 of people, th these are trials, uh, above, around 30% of people judged under informative some sentences as false. This is exactly what you find in other studies. Once you have a felicity judgment, this kind of dropped, uh, the, the, the rate of logical responses drops slightly. This is again what you find uh, in the literature. Um, now, the interesting bit is the congruence. The congruence is, by congruence I mean if you said that some is false, right? Did you select some but not all, okay? And if you selected some true, did you select some and maybe all? As you can see, the rate of congruence was really high, 70%, right? Consistent among studies. What's really interesting is when you look, depend, when, you, when, you, when you look what happens depending on the answer you provided in the first phase. When you respond true, in all three studies, the probability <coughs> that you select some maybe all, is really high. Actually, the fitted probability in the statistical models are between 97 and 99, right? So the probability that you select, if you say some true or felicitous, then you select some maybe all. However, if you select false, the probability that you select some maybe all is close to zero, actually, the fitted probability. In other words, independently of the, the response, people say, yeah, this sentence, I said false, this sentence means some, maybe all. Okay, so no one seems to have explicitly represented this, this, this implicature. Just, if you're interested, we also had control items where some were unambiguously false or unambiguously, unambiguously true, and there people selected some, but not all. So we, 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 we are sure that these are not like the default responses. So we, we, it's, it's just in this condition. So our conclusion there is that the reason why people say false or not right is because they, there is kind of some, they used to the fact that it's not correct to use some in this kind of situation, but there is no activation of the implicature in the sense of the activation of an explicit linguistic representation. The reason why people judge, tend to judge it false or, 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 or wrong is exactly the reason why Grice said they should do it, right? Because in their interactions, they need to used to it. Why not? Because we are rational speakers, we, we respect the maximum quality, right? But we don't, in these cases at least, they don't, they don't derive this linguistic representation. This has important consequences actually for the debates about the grammatical accounts, because if you don't have the explicit derivation of the implicature, then it's not really clear what kind of evidence you're, uh, you're grounding your models on. So yeah, this paper is uh, under review, hopefully it should be published soon. So just as a conclusion, yeah, depending on, on contextual individual factors, pragmatic processes may lead from sentence meaning to speaker's meaning, but we are really used to model pragmatic processes as a relationship between syntactic strings, between re linguistic representation of the sentence meaning and linguistic representations of the speaker's meaning. This is how we model things. This is how we explain things. This is how we teach things. But we should not mistake the theorist representations of sentence meaning with the actual interpretation outputs. We don't really know that always you have this linguistic representation. If, you know, we actually literally mean that linguistic representation is something, you know, right there. So let me, by way of conclusion, going back to irony. And, um, uh, you know, there are two ways, at least. I think it's a really good example, actually, um, that of 
what pragmatic is, or maybe. There are two ways you can miss irony. You know, it happened with all of us, you know. We didn't understand that the first is that the speaker is being ironic. You just mistake the ironic meaning for, for, for the literal one, you know. But what may also happen is that you know that the speaker is being ironic, but you just don't understand what, what they mean, right? And actually, I think that in the literature, these two errors are, are not sufficiently distinguished. And why it's interesting, think about another case where you have these same kind of mistakes, right? Failing an exam, right? First case, you didn't understand why the examiner wanted. You know, you thought that what the examiner wanted is your critical thoughts about their theory. But what they actually wanted is you to remember their theory. You missed, you know, the actual goal. Second case, you, you actually understand what the examiner wants. You know that they want you to, to recite their theory but you just don't remember it, okay? It's exactly the same case. Why it's interesting, this is a classic example of a metacognitive meta process, right? It's an exact, it's, it's the, there is a difference here. You select your goal correctly, but you don't manage to get there. Or you don't select your goal correctly, right? And actually I think that, um, this is what I mean by saying that pragmatics is a really a series of metacognitive processes. You, so you, ha, you, pragmatics is selecting the right goal. You know, sometimes you know what you need is to really get to the speaker's meaning. Sometimes what you need is approximate, you know, be kind of loosely in contact with the guy saying. And pragmatic processing is selecting the right kind of processes and information resources to get to that goal. Sometimes you need perspective shifting. Sometimes you need complex meta representation. Sometimes you need really careful assessing of, 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 of the speaker's background, but sometimes you don't. And you can be mistaken in both ways. Sometimes you, the pragmatic goal is not, is the context based selection of the level of interpretation is not right. And sometimes, uh, you don't select the right resources or you don't have the right resources because you are a child, because you are, uh, sometimes you have difficulties with certain kind of uh, contextual information or per perhaps because you're drunk or whatever, you know? So I think that we need to think more carefully, and this is a kind of a big hand waving, about the difference between metacognitive and really meta-representational processes. Um, and that's about it. So thanks for 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 your um, for your attention, for having me. Uh, thanks to uh, all participants to our experiments, to all the people in the lab, uh, to Philippe de Brabanter, and um, yeah. So all the funders. And if you want to know more about uh, the work we do on autism, uh, these are the links. Thanks. Okay. So the control of how do you control, you said you control for some, uh -huh. and that there, there were, when it was clear cases of some but not all, there were, okay, I mean, my concern oh, yeah. is that, um, I mean, I, I, I can see that basically, okay, there might be a negation that is a kind of, what, what they do, it might be a negation that is a kind of metalinguistic negation, where it's like that's not quite the right way of putting it, okay. But the fact that you show them the, the two uh, possibilities might also be the case that they say, okay, well, maybe all is kind of a better option, let's go for that one. So that's why I want to have a look at these controls. Okay, so the, the controls were, uh, so it's the player scored with some balls, but some were red. 
Okay, so it's literally true, or they, all, they were all red. Okay, and so we 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 just we just uh, uh, and and then the, you had exactly the same thing. So, but the display was with uh, with with the red balls, and it's so not, it's not the red balls. yeah, and so, so it was exactly the same thing. So, the reason why we did that was if if uh, because the obvious worry is that once you present people with both options, they always select the, uh, the logical one. But that's not what we find. When some is an ambiguously false or an ambiguously true, they go for this. Like, at almost like 100%, uh, like 99 or something like that. So, yeah, it's not that. Really low level, really simple minded. Okay, so what about something where they, so what they see is some but not all. What they see in the other, even if they said false, is some but maybe all. What do you mean? So in that display with the reds, what they see in front of them is some but not all. That's what they see. That's really what the display shows. Yeah, uh, well, the display shows is all, but yeah. Ah, yeah, the control is what they see is some but not all, yeah. Yeah, and in that case, they pick up some yeah. but not all. Now, in the display, the other display, uh, the, the, the experimental trial, <coughs> this one. what they see, yeah, is some but, and maybe all. That's what they see. Yeah, but they also see their response. And what you'd expect is that if people would have somehow activated the implicature why, wh while responding, right, while making the judgment, you should find at least some people who are congruent, right? No, I, I agree. So, so, the, so, so the reason why they respond the way they do is, is the reason you give, is that because, you know, they see some, some maybe all, and the reason why there is no interference, nothing that pushes them towards this, even though they have the response, right? They have the response in front of their eyes. It's because it's not has been activated. That's the only explanation. I see. So, the, so basically, the response is uniquely driven by uh, this is not this is not the best way of saying it. Yeah, it's it's driven by the fact that so so kind of consistent with the idea that the default reading of some is the logical one, and that's the one it's there. They, it's, you don't activate the other one. Unless there is a real contradiction with the display, which happens in the control case. So, the, the, I mean, I agree with you about the reason why they respond the way they do. It's just that this shows that when you're responding false, there is no indication, no empirical indication that you actually have the, that the response false or not right is guided by the fact that you derived the implicature. And that has implications about how you, 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 you interpret processing data and how you interpret data about embedded implicatures, by the way. Because the whole debate is that you should have the derivation of the structural uh, embedded implicature in, in, in the non-marked case. why there, there is longer processing times. Um, That's for somebody else to... I mean, it's, I, as I said, it's a really... I mean, it, we did that, as I told you, as a kind of, uh, you know... I, I don't know, perhaps people, people would say this is bullshit, but I was really surprised that no one ever tried this. Thank you for this. I think I think I, I can agree with everything, or I wasn't. Uh, That's the point, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, there are some things that I wouldn't expect. Uh, especially, well, I am going uh, to the ionic example. Uh, the video with the tea and the milk, milk 
Right. With neurotypicals or with autistic? Uh, I don't really mind. Uh, I'm concerned about the, uh, the item itself. So, uh, the example was that the guy said, I, I really like uh, tea or I don't really like tea. Uh, uh, was, was just that? Yeah, so... He, so what he says in these were controlled. Yeah. So so she asked the, what what happens before. She said, "Do you want tea or milk?" Because she said, "Yeah, you know how how much I like tea for breakfast, right?" Okay. So um, uh, intonation or expression didn't help uh, grasping the idea. That was yeah. Okay. So Actually, what happened with neurotypicals mm -hmm. is that when you had marked intonation or marked facial expression. Your responses were much faster, but your accuracy was much lower. Yeah, that's surprising. It's something I wouldn't expect. But I was wondering uh, whether in this example you have like um, a negative attitude or something more typical in irony, because the example seems quite. It's just the reversal of meaning. So I like tea and I don't like tea, or I don't like tea. Mm -hmm. But what's the point of the? I, usually, you are irony because you want to call it as you may, uh, but you want to express a negative attitude, a critical thing. Well, yeah, well, now you're expressing the, the point. So the, the way this, the vignette was said is that, you know, she said, do you want tea or milk? And, and basically the ironic attitude is, come on, you're stupid or what? Do you, do you, you know that I don't like tea? Because in, in the context items, what happened before is you had an exchange saying, okay, you know, I like tea or I don't like tea. And then, so, 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 so then a negative attitude is towards the, the other person. And there were different actors, yeah. Okay, that seems a lot. So facial expressions uh, don't help grasping uh, the enemy, but either the context thing didn't help? No, the context helped. The context is the, is the, the contextual incongruence, that's the cue. Yeah? Okay, that makes much sense because in this example, the context uh, makes uh, the victim and the uh, criticism. Yeah, but. Information on Absolutely, but what's really interesting is this, is that when you ask people just to discriminate between mm -hmm. ironic and non-ironic marked intonation, so what we did, because often what you find is that people contrast neutral inf intonation and, and marked intonation, and they say this is ironic intonation, but it's not that. You're just forcing the choice between marked and, 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 and neutral inf intonation. What we did is that we, we, we really we had three different kinds of marked intonation and three different kinds of marked facial expression. What's interesting is just in the discrimination task, people are really, really, really good. So, and that, that's, that, that, again, that makes sense. I mean, this is why I think that when we test irony, if you just ask people, present people with a false choice, then, you know, that you're not testing irony. You're testing something, comprehension of something. <laughs> But what you mean by less accuracy is that they misunderstood uh, literal no and literal yes uh, items to be ironic when they have prosody or... So what, we ha what happened is that once you had facial expression and neutral expression, they, they either they, they mistook literal yes for ironic or ironic for literal yes. Uh, so both ways, right? So they choose the wrong item, uh, but the thing is that the reactor. So basically, they mistook the the kind of marked intonation it was, but they reacted really fast, so on the spot. And this is exactly it's it's, it's exactly the same. So this is. It's 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 this paper we adapted uh, a design by. Um, e play colleague, so uh, um, so basically you you heard the fun conversation, and sometimes the speaker would be ironic, and you knew that the speaker would be ironic relative to their information, but the the person on the other side of the fun conversation didn't have that privileged information, and the question was, would that person understand that the speaker is ironic or not? Okay, and people are kind of good at this. 
except when you have marked intonation. When you have marked intonation, they, they don't do all the reasoning about what the speaker on the other side of the phone knows. They would say, yeah, yeah, he, it's ironic. So, uh, what's a marked intonation? So, are you talking about the same kind of intonation for any kind of irony? Are you so, what we did is that, we did that, so, so there is, there is so in, that, in, in this paper, um, uh, the, there is quite a detailed analysis of uh, the acoustic properties of different kinds of intonation. Uh, it, this was with different actors and the same with facia facial expression. And uh, the kind of intonational pattern we found for you know, we just asked these professional actors, okay, be ironic, right? And there the were like hundreds of items and hundreds of takes. And, um, this is kind of consistent what, with, with uh, what uh, other studies on, on, on the acoustic properties of in ironic intonation in French show. Because th these, 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 these are obviously really kind of uh, uh, different in different languages for really obvious reasons. Uh, we emphasize the intonation that we would have if we were being a little or something like that. So it's not so clear that we always use uh, a, a same pattern of intonation. Yeah, so basically we had the uh, reverse approach here. So we, we thought, okay, we just asked these people and, and, and the, uh, 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 I'm not showing it here, but you can look in the paper if you're interested. There are really kind of different acoustic properties, like marked acoustic properties. And then we, we run a perception test to see whether, you know, so they do kind of map on something. I mean, you can see that these are, these are there, there is some kind of overlap, but, but uh, the, uh, these were uh, multi-level ordinal uh, models and they really showed uh, uh, a good discrimination of ironic. And the scale was, is it ironic or not, right? Nothing else. So thank you, first, thank you very much. I love the presentation. Uh, okay. And OK, you present many different data. And about autism, I think that, uh, yeah, I totally agree that they might do uh, a lot of problematic processes uh, through other uh, kind of routes and yeah, that don't imply perspective shifting. But when you talk about neurotypicals, especially about irony, you s it seems that what you have are cues in that facilitate. Uh, if, if they don't um, prefer perspective shifting, uh, it's because they prefer something that is less effortful, instead of uh, doing a route that is more effortful, like it could be the case in, uh, in autism. So my question is, uh, do you think that uh, in neurotypicals, even if they, there are other routes for, uh, uh, for other uh, pragmatic processes that are not related to irony, um, we do it spontaneously in conversations through perspective shifting? Well, that's that. That's what what what. So, first of all, I'm, so if autistic people take compensatory routes, routes, it's not these. So, so, so they don't. The reason why it may take longer for them, it's because it's really compensatory. It's not because I don't think that's because they engage in the same kind of perspective shifting. No, not all of them. Uh, now, I. I what I believe is that even as adults, we don't do perspective shifting that much. I, I think we do this from an egocentric pers perspective. There is, but th th this is a really hated debate. With kids, we, 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 we have um, one, well, two papers, one on referential processing that really, uh, by, also by Ekaterina Ostashenko, it's, it's, it's published in GP Learning and Memory. And there we really show that when you carefully analyze the data of the kind that, that, that have, have been presented before, that kids don't take into account, until the age of five, they don't take into account the privileged uh, 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 perspective of, of their interlocutor. And that's, that's kind of, a, um, it's, it's we, we kind of refined um, the previous paradigm used by Matthias and Tomazello and then and 
Yeah, that's, that's, that, 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 I think, is really kind of a strong evidence. So I don't know whether adults in real conversation do perspective shifting or not. My hunch is they don't, but that's just my position. What seems certainly the case is that in this kind of task, whenever you can avoid it, you do. Even though it's not, it's, it's not the best, you know, the best way. And this is a kind of classic case of what's called in social psychology cognitive myopia. You think that you're better at some metacognitive task than you are. So you think that you're better than you are at detecting what, which, which intonation is ironic or not. in which we can uh, discern if they are using one, uh, this perspective system as a lot or not? Yeah, well, I mean, there is this, this huge debate uh, about this kind of referential task uh, uh, between Kayser and Brown Schmidt. So people really kind of the heated debates. I mean, also, it's really interesting. The, um, the evidence from autism is, is interesting also because highly verbal individuals, they don't use compensatory, compensatory strategies all the time. In most of the cases, they're perfectly interacting, you know, right? Uh, and that kind of shows that you can do it, you know, effortlessly. And if they can do it, you know, why would we assume that we do something more complex when it's not needed? That's basically kind of the... But, but, but that's, that's really controversial, and many people would disagree with this, including in this room, I think, but, but, but that's, uh, you know... I'm sure it won't. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, one of your main points is that uh, pragmatic processes uh, uh, and the resources uh, on which they're based uh, depend on uh, uh, individual characteristics uh, and not uh, uh, and uh, like contextual demands uh, and not on an explicit uh, reasoning going on in the mind of the. Uh, uh, of the person, of the interpreter, right? Um, I guess that that's one of the main points. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think that the people who defend like uh, meta representation, meta. There is something explicit. Yeah, I, I, I don't attribute that yeah, to you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, you contrast your model with the, the traditional model where there is a sort of rational reconstruction of the pragmatic processing, right? Uh, as a, an inference between two syntactic strings, and you disagree with this model, right? Um, uh, well, you disagree that you think that this model doesn't uh, capture what's the actual interpretation process. Um, uh, so my question is, uh, uh, the rational, um, uh, call it the rational reconstruction of the inference, uh, which shouldn't be identified with the actual interpretation process. Is that completely useless to us then when we do pragmatics? Or what, what, I mean, it's not clear to me what the role of that rational reconstruction is uh, given, uh, given your picture, I mean, assuming that the picture you provide is the correct one about actual interpretation. Um, and this reminded me also of something Rice himself said at some point, um, he said that there are two ways of uh, making the, uh, like, um, uh, he talked about the hard way and the quick way of uh, doing the inference. Uh, and the hard way is more or less corresponds to the duration of reconstruction. The quick way is guaranteed by habituation uh, and all of that. And so it sounded to me as if uh, your results uh, uh, go in the direction of the quick way. So habituation and all of that, uh, rather than the hard way. But it's not clear to me whether Grice wanted to say that the hard way should be left completely outside of the picture. So my question is, what do you think about the hard way? OK, so, so uh, first, I think the reason why 
you know, white people judge these kind of displays fools, mm -hmm. is precisely the reason Grice gave. It's because when we use language and we, when we learn to use language, we do it in a, an equilibrium situation where people are cooperative. It never happens, this kind of, I mean, these kind of situations never happen except like for, I don't know, games, it said like explicitly, explicit situation where you, the speaker is not supposed to, where being cooperative is not respecting the maxims, right? So I actually think that this, the, the Grice's reconstruction or Grice's like, Grice like reconstruction, but uh, I mean, really even his, explain this. This is why we need them. This is why they write. I mean, this explains everything. What I don't think is that in this particular case, I don't think that there is any ground for saying that this reaction, which is predicted by Grice's model, involves the explicit derivation of the, you know, of the syntactic string that should correspond to, the, to, to this kind of implicature. So this is why I think that this is actually being Grice, <laughs> Grisean. Now, uh, you know, um, I mean, there is a lot of literature, and I actually I spent some time like trying to, at, at some point in my life, I was reading Rice again and again, trying to understand. I, I, I really think that uh, it's not clear. No one can say what, what would be the transposition of Rice's models towards a psychological uh, model. Now, you can always say, yeah, this inferential process, of course, is done the quick way. Uh, there is, it's not explicitly represented in the mind. And um, in this, uh, uh, th this is basically what, uh, or you know, the, the, uh, this is basically what, what um, uh, Ira and Diana say in, in, in this paper. Yeah, I think you can, uh, you, you can say this. It just that then there is no way to distinguish between a reconstruction and the model. What you need, I'm, I, again, as I said, I'm really kind of a simple-minded. If I don't have a clear empirical evidence for something, I, I, I don't know, I, I go for the simplest option, right? You know? uh, so, yeah, sure, you can say there is a compressed way somewhere, but we don't access it explicitly. But, you know, you could say that uh, actually, what happens is that in our in, in this in this experiment, what happens is that people actually, when they see this, they actually derive the scalar implicature, but they, they derive it at a subconscious way or something. Well, okay, right, sure. I, I don't really see how can we falsify that, but yeah, that's basically my point. Yeah, go on. Okay. And then I'll be back. Paul of mine. First, I'm sorry, I, I, I wasn't there. Uh, yeah, yeah, keep explaining that you had to. <laughs> so, it's certainly been a very simple question, Paul of naivety. So, your study three, uh, in effect, you, you are indirectly eliciting what people believe is the standard or conventional or literal meaning of some, right? That's, or, well, okay, mm. maybe you don't. Okay. So that's how I read it, but maybe that's totally yeah. But here's my question. What happens, oh, because I don't know the answer. What happens if you just ask people? If you just say to people, what does some mean? And you could do it open, you could do a multiple choice. Do you get that 70 30 ratio? Actually, it's a really simple thing to do. I don't. I, I, I mean, what, 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 what happens is that some people looked at corpora, and in corpora, the uh, Pragmatic meanings not, are not that frequent, actually. So that's kind of points towards this. this uh, um, so the reason, this is kind of related to Nausicaa questions. The reason why we included uh, some controls, so control, cases like, I should have put them, uh, cases where you know, all the balls were red or some of the balls were red, right? Where this was unambiguously true and unambiguously false, is because we wanted to see 
okay, what, what if, you know, people just have one constant by default interpretation of sum? But the thing is that, whereas in the, what we find is that for the critical items, when sum is under informative, people, like, almost always select sum, maybe all, in the cases where uh, sum is um, you know, ambiguously true or ambiguously false, they select sum, but not all. And that, that, that kind of shows that it's not, at least, this is not about just, you know, people see sum and they have a kind of, some kind of meaning about this. My speculation now, like my, my but I have nothing to, to defend it, is I'm not sure it's, it's that easy to, for people to, that the very question makes sense. I, I, I forgot to, well, I completely okay. Well, no, that's well. Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, you, can, you cannot agree and disagree on the same. <laughs> Oh, uh, no, no, the 70-30 ratio yes, is, 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 is the... Uh, is it easy in the literature? Yeah, but it's only on test items. Right. Oh, okay. It's in the literature, so these are for under-informative um, uh, items. And this is what you find. It's, it's, it's remarkably constant. It's would like... It be interesting if you to ask people directly and you were to get a same 70-30 ratio, would that be interesting? Uh, so, but you, d you did that with embedded implicatures, right? You have different ways... To, to, you, you have higher responses, right, when you have an explicit option, but it was with embedded implicatures. Okay, if, you ask them, if you ask people what does it mean, I mean, if I heard from my students, they would say some, but not all. But right. that's the issue. Yeah. 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 In, in to a what sort of ratio, 100%? I, I, I don't know, but, but I mean, if you tell students it means some and possibly all, you should get it's a revolution every year. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah, that's true, because it's counterintuitive, yeah? But, okay. but, but at the same time, the, the evidence from corpora, that's kind of interesting, yeah. that that's... And it's, and it's very, very strong. Yeah, so I'm very sure it is important in, in actual use. People don't, yeah, people don't often use it in an under-informative way. So that's, that's the... Uh, and it's very consistent. Yeah. Depending on the context they use. Oh, yeah, I wanted... So I think I have more or less the same question. Mm -hmm. So, so... Okay, so you have... You say we have cases where uh, in, in autistic participants... They, they do it, in fact, in a, in a simpler way, in a more direct way, or, or, I mean, at least it's another process. And I think you rightly point out, if they do it this way, and actually interpret this, the utterance correctly, why don't we do the same? Now, the question is, uh, I think it's more or less the same question, in the cases non-autistic participants, but we do it this way. Is it, is it because that's the way we do it? Or is it, is, is it a shorthand procedure? Is it, uh, is it something we've learned to do this? I mean, basically, is there any space in what... I mean, I got the feeling when I presented it that you didn't discard the fact that, there wasn't, that the way we would usually do it might not be the same as what you see in, in participants with autism. By usually, I mean not necessarily more frequently, but the way we initially did it or something like that. Um, you mean so when God we, created us or something? We have two modes of processing, and, or do we have just one? No, I think, I think, I, I think, but again, this is kind of pure speculation, and, uh, you know, it's just about what I intimately believe. Uh, and I may be really, really, really wrong or confused. I think the key there is the usual. I think that as we mature, we become more aware of different conversational goals and of the appropriate situation where we should aim for these goals, but also for the effort we should put into that, right? So I, 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 don't, I don't say we don't have these 
skills of attribution of complex informative intentions, we do, I mean, people date, people go to court, uh, people argue in this kind of, uh, you know, they do job interviews, all this context, you'd better, well, it's easier, at least if you have this. So I'm not saying it's not there, and I'm not saying, I don't know where it appears in the uh, language development. My point is simply that I don't think that these processes are inherent in what it is to interpret in utterance. That's, that's a linguistic or, that, that's my point. It's just that. of directionality, do we start, for some of these phenomena, do we start with a more complex um, interpretive process that would involve more uh, cognitive ability? You mean in development? Oh. Yeah, let's say. In the, in the, so, so maybe, so do, do we start this way and then realize that there are some cues that make us be able to bypass that and because what I understand from what you said is that uh, the participants with autism used basically cues. There, there are some cues that... They just used contextual incongruence. Yes, well, which is a cue. Which is a cue, uh, yeah. and, and, and I'm sure they can use some other cues in some well, other situations. Well, uh, yeah. Well, facial, facial expression intonation actually confused them more than... Yeah. But, but yeah. yeah, but these are also psychological so yeah. that might, uh, um, so, so we might be able to use also psychological cues as cues, maybe mm -hmm. in a way that they can't. So do we start by a full-blown process in a sense, and then uh, shorten it because then we realize, oh, well, I can use that cue in that case, it's much faster, and, and, and then I make many mistakes, as you pointed out, because I use, I, I use the um, And when I, I say in development also, not in early development, where maybe the process is not growing yet. Um, or, or, is it, or is it the other way? Or, is it, or do we not start there? I mean, because, because what you just said just before made me think, oh, maybe you think we start with something simpler that we might be able to elaborate on in specific circumstances where we need more, more information. I mean, this is a, b a bit where we, we, it harks a bit back to the discussion we had yesterday, right, before we run and run into these Manchester United supporters, <laughs> but but but, but, uh, but uh, I, I mean I have no answer. But as again from from the work we did on referential processing in young kids, my my feeling is that you don't start with this. At three or between three and five, you you already kind of a really good communicator and really good verbal communicator, I mean linguistic communicator, but you don't do this spontaneously. And it's exactly the same thing, the things about this literature we discussed yesterday about the epistemic trust, right, you know, you can discard unreliable information but not more complex cases, you know, you can discard sources but not really make inferences about you know what they what they think, and I mean this is a hugely complex issue, and it I mean it it it, it it's linked to the debate about all this early mind reading, you know how to explain it. So I I I, I won't you know put my hand into that; uh, it'd be too dangerous. But my personal hunch is that it's something develops later. But, yeah, as you said yesterday yourself, there are cases, it's really clear, there, is, there are cases where developmental threshold is there, irony this, and successful deception, that's kind of, that seems really kind of there. Yeah, so... I'm less convinced about all the cases. Sure, but I'm less convinced that all the cases really, to be actually good at them, you actually need perspective taking. You know, irony in a successful deception, you really need that one. So, that's... Oh, well, I have a couple of points. Uh, uh, my question, yes. 
Well, thanks. Very interesting. <laughs> uh, I found it especially, I'm especially sympathetic to your couple of conclusions at the end. Uh, one, I think it was already in Yolanda's uh, thesis yesterday, the, the thing about different partial understandings of, of ironic assertion, right? That you, yeah. might, you might identify that there's something negative Absolutely. there, but don't identify the victim or the target or, or well. Um, uh, the other one has to do with the difference between what us theorists uh, use to represent us an implicature, right? And what we assume that to be really in, this, in the hero's mind. So I was a bit surprised about this interpretation uh, of, uh, sin, I mean, implicature as a syntactic, I mean, linguistic representation in the hero's head. And I mean, like, I mean, if that's what people understand, that's, that's not crazy at all, I would say. I don't know, in my humble, but if it's need to be stressed, uh, it's a bad symptom about the interpretation of crisis, I would say, or and something Maybe, I was do, not, do, do, do you know? Do, do. I mean, like it's an inference from something syntactic strings to syntactic mm. strings. Like, we should uh, introduce this to some people then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but but, but, but no 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 no. But but but. Your, your point, but I, I mean, for instance, um, uh, where is it? Um, this is a really good paper about about this position. So it's a it's it's a defense of the grammatical account of of of, um, of scalar implicatures. But what's interesting is that in, so it's it's actually there are two two parts in this in this in this paper. They explicitly say this has to map on performance properties. So so, so it's really kind of you know. Uh, so the, the, there is a structural argument. The structural argument, like in all generative syntax, you, 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 the tradition is to have structural arguments. The structural argument is based on embedded implicatures, whether they exist or not. I, I really think they don't, but, but that's, that's, that's another debate. Uh, uh, but, 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 but so they explicitly say that all these kind of models have to map on processing properties, and they uh, this is not some com some kind of uh, you know, some 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 tiny view. I mean, it's it's not a minority position, <laughs> or like far from it. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think you opened the last issue of linguistic and philosophy. I haven't seen it, but I would bet that there is a paper related to this. So you know. Okay. So, uh, so the question, like the, the question, also uh, epistemic trust and your experiment of epistemic trust. And uh, well, I was not surprised. Man. The question is naive. I mean, um, what's the rational position to take? I mean, should we trust the secure guy that knows everything and has answers apparently correct for everything, or should we trust the guy say, I don't know, and I will use, you know, the puppet who knows better and. Uh, I'm the kind of, it seems that the experiment is a universal truth that we automatically trust the guy who speaks with you know, <laughs> That's a cool question. The, but personally, I think it would be. Mm. Nowadays, society, we prefer so the, the journalist to say, well, I don't know, I will ask an expert about the meaning of this before answering you. I don't know. Perhaps uh, we, should track, <laughs> we should track the political orientation of these kids like yeah. some... 15 years later, <laughs> but, but actually it's, it's, it's a cool point. I mean, yeah, yeah, I've never, <laughs> no, but, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, what are the I think the, 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 the thing is, I mean, if you, if you build uh, some kind of uh, just so uh, naive uh, toy evolutionary story, you know, if you have to check everything with multiple guys, your life becomes really difficult, you know? Uh, whereas if you think, okay, you know, Cap is someone I trust, I'll ask him all the information. Well, not about you, about all the trains. You're the guy, you know, I won't check with you, say. That's, you know, easier. Yeah, yeah. Any more questions? So, I think we're here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.